Good morning. I'm Joanna Grork. I am the Vice President for Exhibitions and Programming here at the New York Botanical Garden. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. These uh, first few Saturday mornings when we start to feel those first hints of fall are among the best here at the garden, so we're grateful that all of you have joined us here today. And we're grateful that you're joining us to celebrate the opening of the Bond of Live Things Everywhere. Curated by Joshua Bennett, this word and sound installation stages black poetry and performance in the open air in celebration of nature and our creative engagement with it. And it's our honor to present this very special project, this symposium, and day's events, and all of the programs that will be taking place over the next eight weeks, together with our wonderful partners at Poetry Society of America. We've been very grateful to be partners with them for many years now, and we're thrilled that they thought of us when it was time to think about this project. Joshua Bennett is a professor of English and creative writing at Dartmouth College. He is the author of The Sobbing School, which was a national poetry series winner and a finalist for the NAACP Image Award, as well as Being Property Once Myself, Blackness and the End of Man, Ode, and his latest work, The Study of Human Life, which will be released this month. In 2021, he received a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Whiting Award in Poetry and Nonfiction. He has also received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, MIT, the Ford Foundation, and the Society of Fellows at Harvard University. He's famous. <laughs> and today, he will serve as our moderator for this two-part symposium, a conversation on black ecological thought. For the first discussion, the use of flowers, Joshua is joined by storyteller, horticulturist, and author of the forthcoming book, Conquer the Soil, Black America and the Untold Stories of Our far Country's Gardeners, Farmers, and Growers, Abra Lee, and author of the poetry collections Teeth, Kingdom Animalia, and the Black Maria, Araceli Skirmay. Following their conversation, we welcome the founding co-executive director and farm director of Soul Fire Farm, and author of Farming While Black, Soul Fire Farm's Practical Guide, to Liberation on the Land, Leah Penniman, Associate Professor in the Department of English at New York University, and the author of Cultivation and Catastrophe, the Lyric Ecology of Modern Black Literature, Sonia Posmentier, and Terence Hayes, whose most recent publications include American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin, and To Float in the Space Between, Drawings and Essays in Conversation with Etheridge Knight which won the Poetry Foundation's 2019 Pegasus Award for Poetry Criticism and was a finalist for the 2018 National Book Critics Circle Award in Criticism. These three esteemed panelists will, jo will join us to tackle the topic of the earth as a living thing. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the many individuals who have made this special installation and the accompanying events possible. Of course, as I mentioned, these are wonderful events are all presented in partnership with Poetry Society of America. And I'd like to offer special thanks to Executive Director Matthew Brogan for thinking of us as the setting for this very exciting project. Joshua's vision was supported and realized by a remarkable creative team featuring Marcos Key and Marcus Johnson. I would also like to thank everyone in exhibitions and programming here at the Garden, especially Thomas Mulher and his entire team. And on behalf of NYBG, I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Lewester T. Martz Charitable Trust. And Poetry Society of America has received support from the, from the Destina Foundation, the David Rockefeller Fund, Humanities New York, and additional support by the New York City Department for Cultural Affairs, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the New York State Council on the Arts. And now, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome Joshua Bennett to the stage. Thank you so much, Joanne, for that introduction. Y'all all right? How y'all doing? Good. All right. Came up in a black church. You got to check in first before you start talking. Good morning. My name is Joshua Bennett, and I'm a professor of English and creative writing at Dartmouth, a poet, 
and years before I was either of those things, a child of the Bronx. So it feels great to be back home on this occasion with you all. I can think of no better place to help usher this particular dream of mine into the world. First, I just want to add more thanks to my collaborators, the Poetry Society of America, especially Matt Brogan, who first approached me about this potential team up many months ago, as well as Brett Fletcher Lauer. Both have worked tirelessly to help realize today's vision, and I owe them a great deal. Thank you to our brilliant designers, Yael and John at Morcos Key, and to Marcus Johnson, our soundscape engineer, who is my longtime co-conspirator and confidant. Finally, my sincerest thanks to the entire team at the New York Botanical Garden for their trust, their care, and their willingness to take this adventure with me and all my friends. In collaboration with the garden, our team has spent the past year designing the immersive installation we are here to celebrate today, the bond of live things everywhere. Its title was inspired by the work of Lucille Clifton, whose voice is included in the installation herself. You can hear her singing from the trees and whose capacious vision helped inspire this project in the first place. For many of the writers you will hear today, the love and study of black poetry is not limited to the bounds of academic institutions. Rather, it is expressed at its very best in a commitment to care for the earth. It requires that we go outside, read the skies, and listen to the wisdom of what does not communicate in human speech, but calls out to us in a song as old as the land we share. A brief bit of history. In her Federal Writers Project interview recorded in the late 1930s, a formerly enslaved black woman named Mandy Jones tells a story of what she calls pit schools, spaces that enslaved people dug into the ground to teach each other to read under the cover of nightfall. These were classrooms built not from brick and mortar, but from dirt and leaves, the trunks of trees, candlelight enrobed by darkness. For Jones, Black education is an underground affair, and this bitter earth is a mask we wear. It grins and lies and hides the minds we hone in secret. The pit school was a respite and a retreat. What's more, one of the pit schools that Jones describes in her interview is also part of a tradition. It is an inheritance passed down from person to person, from a parent to their child to future generations of black students. After emancipation, one of these pit schools was run by a man named Henry Gunn and came above ground. Its resources were shared with a much larger group of children than we imagine a hole in the ground might hold. But the traces of that supernatural subterranean practice remain. This project is one of the many ways I hope to honor that history, to create a space of not only deep study, but astonishing encounter, to return us to the clearing where we might hear a constellation of human voices together with a much older melody, one that echoes through the trees and the soil and the birds of the air, so that every time we get together, it's a rehearsal for another world. In closing, I'll share a poem. It comes from my new book, The Study of Human Life, which has a section devoted to my son, August Galileo, who uh, turns two in a couple weeks and is probably home with his grandma right now watching Blue's Clues. <laughs> this is dad poem number 10. And thank you to Leah for mentioning uh, apples in the green room. Originally, I was going to read a different one, but you got to improvise if the spirit leads. All right. You can't have apples with everything, we say to our son over breakfast. But that's not technically true. He knows this, I suspect, though his face reflects a certain understanding as if he's willing to negotiate. Before we moved here, I knew so little of apples, their untamed array of shapes and names, ginger gold, honey crisp, crispin, Cortland, cameo, both Rome and empire somehow, which feels like it must be an inside joke between members of the committee. Fuji, wine sap. Ruby Frost, which could be either a miracle or a plague. I can't decide which. Paula Red is a Soviet secret agent. Envy is a deadly sin. Holstein and Ambrosia have skin like a storm on a televised map. On the ride upstate to the orchard, I recount all the types to myself in a private game. Select my prize in advance. 
Bags filled with liberty and jazz will be my aims, like any good American. Two months earlier, it is not yet my birthday. I'm in an office in Brighton. The doctor has never seen a case quite like mine. During the test, I make every task a language game, even the one with seven circles and blocks. This part of my mind is hypercharged, he says, like a quasar or a loving dispute. That morning, I cut a brie burn into eighths and cast the pieces into a small blue bowl, a handful of rowboats swaying. At the orchard, we are stars set loose across the mind of a boy in a field on his back, dreaming with both eyes open. We run for hours. We gather enough apples to sate ourselves for weeks on nothing but their cold red wealth. What marvels, this most metaphorical of fruits. Newtonian, Edenic, pure delight, mighty and bright. And the orchard, like a coliseum of planets you could hold in your hand. And now for, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So now to get to our collective of geniuses. Abra Lee is a storyteller, horticulturist, and author of the forthcoming book, Conquer the Soil, Black America and the Untold Stories of Our Country's Gardeners, Farmers, and Growers. She has spent a whole lot of time in the dirt, what a beautiful line, as a municipal arborist and airport landscape manager. Her work has been featured in publications including the New York Times, Fine Gardening, and Veranda Magazine. Lee is a graduate of Auburn University College of Agriculture and an alumna of the Longwood Gardens Society of Fellows, a global network of public horticulture professionals. Can we give it up for Abra one time? All right. And our second speaker on the panel will be Araceli Skirme, who was born in California and lives and teaches in New York. She is the author of the poetry collections Teeth, Kingdom Animalia, and The Black Maria. For this work, she was a finalist for the New Stott International Prize for Literature in 2018. She is the author slash collagist of the picture book Changing Changing, and with her sister collaborated on the picture book What Do You Know? I own both of those books and I've read them to my son at least a hundred times. Y'all, please welcome to the stage, Abrilly. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Joshua, thank you from the warm introduction. And I think it's so um, fitting that your exhibition opens in the Bronx, your home. But for me, as a Southerner, I'm always tickled because I'm like, this is the boogie down Bronx, the home of hip hop, these poets. And in hip hop music and rap, they talk about your favorite rapper's favorite rapper. And so I wanted to talk about um, your favorite poet's favorite poet. And part of that were uh, black women, specifically two black women, Georgia Douglas Johnson and Ann Spencer, who were honestly fangirls of a woman named Effie Lee Newsom, who was an eco-poet, nature writer of children's poetry. And she released a book of children's poetry in 1941. And I wanna make sure I'm doing the clicker correct. Uh, okay, there we go. So, um, I'm gonna read a little bit of a letter that was written. Uh, actually, it was, um, it was in a review of the book Gladiola Garden. This is, these are Georgia Douglas Johnson's words I'm about to read. So she is here on your, I guess that's your left, Colonel Charles Young, who uh, also is a deep na nature lover. If you don't know him, this is the first black superintendent of a national park, Sequoia Parks out in California. He's the third black graduate of West Point and also founded the ROTC and band uh, departments spoke many languages at Wilberforce, and Effie Lee Newsom is in the middle. So in October 1941, Georgia Douglas Johnson says this, Charles Young, who we remember as a gentleman, soldier, and scholar, said to me, there is a very special poet and lady whom I want you to know, Effie Lee Newsom. Thereupon, in an introduction by mail, followed and I found myself enriched by the acquaintance of Mrs. Newsom. Since that time, I have been continually refreshed and lifted in spirit through her letters that are so unique and remarkable that I have saved every scrap of paper 
upon which they are written. There are no others like them. And she goes on to write a glowing review about the book uh, Gladiola Garden. And I'm not going to, in the interest of time, read all of that. But I do want to talk about um, one of the connections that they have. So uh, another thing I wanted to say about Charles um, Young is that he is a close friend and confidant of W.B. Du Bois. And here is a um, section of the Crisis Magazine from October 1922. This was um, published in the children's number, which came out one time a year. The Crisis Magazine being the official magazine of the NAACP, and W.E.B. Du Bois is the editor of that magazine and also one of the founding members of the NAACP. And what's phenomenal here is that you see um, Effie Lee Newsom and Georgia Douglas Johnson's work side by side. And at the height of the Jim Crow era, where Georgia Douglas Johnson, um, this very famous poem about motherhood and the reluctancy to bring a black and brown child into this world um, where active lynchings are occurring, especially in the American South, Effie Lee Newsom writes about nature in a way that is so loving and, and, and makes, takes the fear out of nature for children. And obviously with these active lynchings happening um, with people being hung by oak trees uh, and it being a public spectacle in the South. And I love this poem because it, it reminds me of like James Brown say it loud, I'm bracken, I'm proud, but in, in a 1922 form. And um, I'm gonna read the poem. It's called The Bronze Legacy by Effie Lee Newsom, to a brown boy. Tis a noble gift to be brown, all brown, like the strongest things that make up this earth, like the mountains grave and grand, even like the very land, even like the trunks of trees, even oaks to be like these. God builds his strength in bronze, to be brown like thrush and lark, like the subtle wren so dark. Nay, the king of beasts wears brown, eagles are of this same hue. I thank God that I am brown. Brown has mighty things to do. And so it's just really perspective and how she looks at, there's the only thing you can compare your blackness to little black child is nature and the mighty oak tree and the earth that we're on. And that's just phenomenal. And moving on, um, we talked about, I talked about your favorite poet's favorite poet, um, is I wanted to read this letter that Ann Spencer, an excerpt from a letter. So Ann Spencer is on your right, the famous Harlem Renaissance writer, librarian, teacher, beautiful garden of hers in um, Lynchburg, Virginia. And she writes this letter to W.B. Du Bois. So I hope that you see all these people are in the same circle. This is in December, 1927. And Ann Spencer is suggesting to W.B. Du Bois that Effie Lee Newsom should write a book. She says to Du Bois, but why, for the sake of little Negro children, don't you have Effie Lee Newsom put some of her lovely stories, bits of charming information, and verse into slender books for our great children? I work here in the library and know at first hand the dearth of such material. Many places they be used as textbooks. No one can be taught preciousness and beauty after his maturity. And then she goes on to say in the letter, take a tip there's money in it. And I just think that's so funny. <laughs> Who besides these black women of the Harlem Renaissance would talk to W.B. Du Bois like that and tell him to take a tip? So my last slide I want to share with you is this one. And the book comes into fruition. This is a, a book called Gladiola Garden. You can purchase it today. It was re-released in 1920. And I, I do mean this. this is my prized possession. It's an original copy of the book. And the hard cover on the inside the book is uh, pretty much a master class in, in black history. Effie Lee Newsom writes the book. Lois May Lou Jones illustrates the book. She is the black woman that launched the art department at Howard University. And the book is published by the Associated Publishers, which is the publishing house of Carter G. Woodson, the founder of Negro History Week, the historian that, and we know that that is now Black History Month. And I'm gonna read one poem from the book, the title poem of the book called Gladiola Garden. In red and orange, cream and rose, the happy gladiola grows. In slim green boots, in tall green rows. There are so many colors here, so many tints, so much good cheer. Oh, little girl, oh, little boy, in gardens of mixed shades, much joy. One really has to think of you, for you are many colors too. In cheery dresses, suits and shoes, in those gay colored hats you choose, 
with light and gladness in your faces, you make through earth gay garden places. So again, Effie Lee Newsom uses nature uh, to uplift black children in the 1940s and honestly to this day. I mean, this is a legendary book and some legendary people and thank you so much for having me today. All right. Wow. Thank you, Abra. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, everyone. I'm um, so grateful to be here with you all. Um, I'm Maracelis, and I have some notes, a kind of meditation um, pulled from a piece of writing that I started in 2020, um, and then kind of differently a bloom. Um, thinking towards this incredible, moving exhibit gathering. Um, in the spring of 2020, we are in our apartment, two kids and two parents, always together. We spend stretches of time looking out of the kitchen window and grow accustomed to other neighbors looking out of their windows or sometimes drying, checking, rearranging sheets and clothes on fire escapes. By the end of May, my son has just turned five and his sister, my daughter, will soon be three. George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. Children as young as my two children walk carrying signs and are lifted to the shoulders of their parents with varying degrees of risk and urgency, resisting, clogging the system, the streets. We do not take our children to the marches. My son and my daughter are in their parents' skin again, consuming only what we want them to consume. For a few months, we are the only ones making decisions about what we tell our children and when. For a few months, nobody says to them, he was killed or she was killed or they were treated unfairly because of how they look or act or the color of their skin or who they are, refusing to name the poison of whiteness in the sentence. There is a little more time to work on our children's armor before they go out again into the further world, which yes, we also love and want them to be in. We want them in the world with our family. We want them running in the sunlight with their laughing friends. These months, I move fast through the house, then slow, trying to listen for my mothers. The kids and I spend an afternoon boiling peony petals in the water, then taking turns mashing them in the pilon. For whole hours, there are the petals of flowers, the juices of flowers, the colors of flowers in our hands. We wash the paper in pigment, and the color goes from a nearly invisible violet to a purple so strong it is like medicine. That's the window. That's the pilon. That's a piece of paper washed. It gets darker and darker through the night, even in our sleep. They know this now. Something about the more than you can see. Violet inside the petal, purple inside the violet. Our togetherness inside the purple and dreaming inside of that. That color will always be a refuge and room in time we share. With the pigment, my son makes a birthday card to mail to Jide. He writes treehouse very neatly in nine brown letters on the bottom of the paper. I don't know why. Maybe because it is the most wonderful idea he can think of to offer. When I ask him something like, why treehouse, he asks me, have you ever even seen a treehouse? <laughs> I am tickled beside his joy that such a thing exists. I take a note with my own paper and pencil, a house inside a tree. Oops, it looks like I wrote free. I am late in my 30s when I hear for the first time from my dear friend Ross that one of the strategies of petite marinage for enslaved people was to go into the tops and trunks of trees, finding and keeping a refuge there. If I am correct, I think I remember him saying that he read somewhere that petite marinage could mean climbing up a tree for just a few hours of refuge, then coming back down. 
You can hear Ross reading the poem, Thank You Today, here in the trees. He says, curl your toes into the grass. Watch the cloud ascending from your lips. Walk through your garden's dormant splendor. We boil the peonies. We go outside to walk beneath the leaves. We sit beside the windows. Maybe there is always a garden of world, of memory, of mind to walk through. But it's the dormant part of the splendor that my own mind is on now. The splendor in what is suspended, quiet, the period of rest, the rest inside the flower, the flower inside the rest. For years, I raced from here to there and was not still. The signs on the train for instant oatmeal are the opposite of rest. Capitalism is the opposite of black rest. This nation is the opposite of the flower. Nikki Giovanni said, and I stood perfectly still and was a flower. She said, I reached to love them all and I squeezed them and they became a spring rain and I stood perfectly still and was a flower. I made decisions about my time, I sold my time. So much of my mother's time was stolen as was her mother's and her mother's. So many generations like that. But also, my mother had learned from those mothers to make. She would sometimes fill the trunk of her car with palm husks that fell from city trees in Irvine, Santa Ana, Long Beach, and she'd bring them home and spend weeks painting a single face on a single husk, husk after husk of eyes and noses and lips. What stillness of spirit to watch her work. What staying right here, but also going somewhere else, touching down into what I can only think of as an else self. And when my youngest was born and I was still deeply grieving my father's stroke, I knew to visit the roses in the box of lavender a few blocks down. That lavender grew so crazily, so splayed and sturdy. I was visiting for a resuscitation and to touch my baby daughter's hands to it for sustenance, strength, elders, the meeting of something powerful and wild as her waking from its dormancy. Thank you. We have one more round of applause for Abra Lee and Araceli Sperme. My goodness, that was stunning. I want y'all both just to teach a class on the art of presentations. How crisp, right? Just beauty in such economy. OK, so the title of this panel comes from a Lorraine Hansberry play called The Use of Flowers, right? And in that play, uh, the beginning of the world, or the end of the world, rather, is the beginning of the play, OK? So we start in a post-apocalyptic event. A man comes out of the woods, and he sees children who don't know how to speak. They're beating each other up and just tearing the place apart. And he tries to teach them words. And he starts with, uh, he ends with flowers. And right before flowers, he gives them the word use. And it's so abstract, he has a hard time getting them to figure it out. And so they, they deal with music, and it's a, it's a beautiful play. But that play from Hansberry taught me something quite particular about tradition um, and how we enter this sort of archive. So I wanted to know, where did you all first encounter the archive of black environmental writing? Was it an experience in a garden? Was it in a library? Was it in a classroom? Was it quiet moments with your mother talking about husks and the faces on them? What was that journey like for you both? Narcellus, we could start with you. Sure, is this on? Yes. That's a, that's a good question. Probably um, just being, like being around elders who are showing you how to be in the world, um, but I do remember when I was in high school, um, I've written about this before, but I remember that I, where I was standing um, when I came across Lucille Clifton's The Book of Light. And um, she's somebody who, um, the moment I opened the book, I didn't know what I was even reaching for. Maybe it was the title. I didn't know who Lucille Clifton was. Um, but she's a, poem, a poet who has been like my my teacher since then. Um, and I was so struck by this sound, this way of writing that I felt like a whisper in my ear, and a deep, deep regard, love, understanding 
of our kinship with everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I was so struck that I, I mean, I remember what direction I was facing. I remember what was to my left, what was, I mean, I, it, was, it was that moment where, you, where you, I felt like, oh, someone is speaking the world in a poem like this, you know? Uh, for me, it was my mom, who mm. is a retired educator, uh, a historian, is what she, she taught history. And in 2007, I got hired as landscape manager at Atlanta's airport. And what I struggled with at that job in the beginning was imposter syndrome, not because I was black and a woman, but because I was young. I was in my 20s when I got this leadership role. And I remember telling my mom, this was before social media really is what it is today and we can connect and I know you and Aracelis and Leah, Sonia, Terrence. And I remember telling her I was the only one that was doing this. And my mom said, Abra, who do you think did landscapes and gardens and were head gardens before you came along? So to her, that was such an ignorant statement. Mm -hmm. And she <laughs> introduced me to this whole world of, of ancestors. And I mentioned this to Terrence earlier in the first one of the first people she mentioned to me um, was, actually the first person she mentioned to me was this black man who was an entomological artist at Ohio State in the 1940s and she showed me his picture and his work and his art was created, he created this art to teach the uh, entomology students and then she introduced me to a woman named, not personally, but on paper, uh, Annie Mae Van Reed who was a black woman that owned a five acre nursery in Greenhouse in Darlington, South Carolina from 1920 to the 1960s. And essentially she was like the Madam C.J. Walker of flowers. Mm. If we converted her worth to today's wealth, it would be $1.2 million. And so from then on, I just, it was like going down a rabbit hole and, and knowing where we came from and who we came from. And not that I was the only one, it was just I was coming from a rich history mm. of leaders in environmentalism and agriculture and horticulture. That entomologist, was his name Charles Henry Turner? It was, his name was William, uh, Charles William Costello. Okay. Yeah. So another Charles, that's interesting. So I discovered Charles Henry Turner, another entomologist, through a children's book called Bug Watching with Charles Henry Turner. Okay. And that leads into my next question. Why do you think teaching children, creating children's books, like what Effie Newsom was doing, mm -hmm. why is that such a core component of what so many of these black environmental poets are up to? I mean, Lucille Clifton, who inspired today, had six kids, right? And part of why the, those poems are so short, you know, the legend goes is that she had to write them between one falling asleep and one waking up, right? Yeah. So what is your sense of the, the role of children in this tradition we, we love and study? Oh, well, I think, I feel like Anne Spencer says it best when she said that no one can be taught preciousness, preciousness and beauty, I think, beyond their, their childhood. And so what I take from that, um, when she, she made that comment to Du Bois in that letter, is these women, Effie Lee Newsom, Georgia Douglas Johnson, um, Anne Spencer, value, and rightfully so, and understand beauty as a quality of life issue, no different than fresh water or access to food. Mm -hmm. And so for you to live a full life, that has to be a, 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 a life necessity that is available to you, no matter what level of life that you're in. So that's why I think it's important to them, because they don't want that to be denied mm -hmm. to these children, especially during this era that they're living in. That's, that's my thoughts. I think also, I was just reading the other day, and now I'm forgetting the, the name of the essay, but June Jordan, where she's talking about um, children's literature. It's in um, Revolutionary Mothering, which is an incredible anthology, um, if you don't know it. Um, one of the editors is Alexis Pauline Gums, I think Maya Williams, and there's one more who, I'm sorry, whose name I'm forgetting. Um, but this piece, it was a, a, a kind of a speech that June Jordan delivered um, at Berkeley where she's talking about the importance of children's literature. And at some point, she speaks to young people. But she's, she talks about love as life force. And she also talks about how we have to make love necessary. We have to make love strong. We have to respect love as life force. And that part of the work of 
of writing towards children and raising children and trying to listen, I'm saying that to myself, to my children, um, is, is trying to make a space for their freedom. Wow. Right? And, and part of that, I mean, they're making beauty and sound, and that's, they, that, that is part of their practice. Um, and, and trying to attend to that and make sure that we, we mark out spaces because there are so terribly, so sadly, so yeah. such pressures against those spaces. And what you say, that's part of what I want to feed my mm -hmm. children is the milk that is green, that is theirs, that is the imagination, that is the world. Um, it is vital. It is, you know. Yeah, that's I stunning. I want to hear what you. What, what I think, yeah. I'm not sure. That's a great question. I mean, um, mm -hmm. well, look. well, no, I'm thinking about that. I love that redirection. I mean, look, so we can stick with June, right? And she talks about the idea that, uh, that children come to us from the future, mm -hmm. right? And that the future belongs to them. And part of the reason the world hates children is because they embody a vulnerability that we actually all share, mm -hmm. right? And that part of what it means to become an adult for so many of us is to actively tear away at that and say, no, that needs to be lost. That's a lie. What you need to do now is grow up and lose that vulnerability, that attention to beauty, that willingness uh, to take rest or recess, right? What happened to recess, right? Just a window of time during the day where you run outside and vent games. And I mean, it's so funny. Whenever I can, I start with June Jordan's essay, The Difficult Miracle of Black Poetry in America, where she said, you know, one of our first poets, right, on this land was Phyllis Wheatley, who was a child. I think people forget, right? In addition to being the sort of first published black woman here, she was a child, she was a child prodigy who was made to perform her brilliance in front of people. And um, June is someone, and she ends that, that essay with a poem, right? Which does segue into my next question. <laughs> Telepathy is something else. I feel like we're all connected in a bunch of different ways. So June was someone who I love teaching for many reasons, her humor perhaps chief among them, but she was a Mount Rushmore polymath, right? She could just move between genres seemingly effortlessly, though we know a lot of effort went into it, right? What is your relationship to genre? Because both of y'all do a lot of things well, right? Public historian, horticulturist, landscape designer, right? Right, and children's books, poems, essays, and like I say, y'all both killed that presentation, right? Can you talk to us about your relationship to genre, um, why it matters to you, if it does at all, and uh, what role it plays in just your everyday work and, and life, the dance between genres? I can um, start by saying um, I, we just, I mean, we, we meaning my brother and I, were really lucky to have parents who were um, very playful. My mom <laughs> was very, also very strict, um, but also there was a lot of play, and so we were always playing, encouraged to play, making things, kind of following our instincts when it came to making things. Um, and I think that that kind of, I, I somehow, that was just how I knew to be for a long time until I went to graduate school. Um, I chose poetry because I was bewildered by it. And now when I look back, I'm like, oh, the student loans. I wish somebody had <laughs> talked to me uh, about it. But I was like, I, was like, I don't know. I, I feel so confused and bewildered by poetry. Like, let me, let me study this more. And when I got there, um, there was this tension between what I wanted to do, which was to try to do many things, and this kind of pressure to focus. And I think those pressures, when I think about it, also had to do with like um, the momentum of, of publishing and opportunities and all of these, like the paperwork that says choose one or what are you doing? Um, what, which thing are you doing? And so I kept ch choosing one. And I realized before I knew it, I had like started to, uh, I was an octopus and then I was like suddenly <laughs> not. I was, I had one thing. Um, and I've been trying to get, I've been trying to get that back um, because I realize like these, these things don't come as genre. I'm thinking about Simone White, a friend of a few of ours, but she was like, if, you, if you're talking about genre, you're missing the point, you know? Mm -hmm. Like if that's, if you're just stuck on that. Um, yeah, yeah. For me, because my writing, I'm not a poet, but with someone like a Effie Lee Newsom, Ann Spencer, Georgia Douglas Johnson, I'm certainly inspired 
as a person that writes um, historical narratives under the, the gaze of uh, black America in, in horticulture. And um, I think what, what shifted for me were a few things. Um, you mentioned the, the journey I've had earlier through airports and being an arborist. And I remember my first job, I was on a floriculture crew um, doing flowers and perennial beds on an estate. And once I started learning about these people, I think what really flipped a switch for me is because I wasn't just reading about them, I, I lived it. These people mm -hmm. weren't just, Effie Lee Newsom lived into her 90s, as did Ann Spencer. So their whole life was dedicated to nature and the environment. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. mine is too. And so I felt like, and, and I am on the same journey um, as so many of these people that I certainly uh, read, write, and, and teach about. And then also, it's um, the name of um, our talk about flowers, uh, this panel right now. I think about how, when I was on that floriculture crew, when I was an intern, it was my first real job, paying job, actually my second, um, as a college student in horticulture, and I worked on this estate of, well, I'll say it, I'm not saying it to brag, I'm just saying it to give context. This man named Arthur Blank, who owned Home Depot, I didn't know him, he owned the terrible Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> and anyway, I, I say that because when this man had extreme wealth, he's a billionaire. His garden was phenomenal in his defense because money doesn't mean you have good taste. But <laughs> what I connected with there was I grew up in Atlanta, but every weekend my mama would take us down to Barnesville, Georgia, the dirt road country. And there, on our family's farm, that 27 acres with cows and chickens and smokehouse, they had heirloom flowers in that garden. And this was a rural, southern, a folk garden, the, like swept yard, stones, all of that. And so I, it made me realize that luxury wasn't this thing of wealth that was on the table. I, it's, I, I understood luxury. I slept under handmade quilts. And I ate food out of that pot belly stove that was still lit with wood. And I was out there with these heirloom daffodils. So mm -hmm. it made me understand what I think Ann Spencer was saying, that luxury is what this is. This is what wealth is. It's not this financial thing. It's what's available to you, to everyone, through nature. So That's astonishing. Hold on, I got to sit with that. You see me rocking. That's how, yeah. that's how you know it's saying. I'm like, wait a minute. OK. It's available to everyone. I love that, that democratic vision. So y'all both talked a bit about recovery. I love the idea of recovering the feeling of being an octopus. I'm going to keep that with me, right? And recovering the language and beauty of our youth, even in what may be felt like deprivation in that moment. You go back to it, and you're like, no, that was plenty, right? It was so much. Like, uh, I don't think my mom's in here, so she can't yell at me about it. We didn't really have the heat on all the time in the winter. And so I my big sister's laughing. And so we would lay under these like five covers, you know, to, to keep warm. And looking back, that feels luxurious to me, you know, well, well before the weighted blanket arrived in the market, you know. I had my five big blankets and I was warm as anything else. But can y'all talk a little bit more about recovery and maybe even um, sort of the sights and sounds and names we should recover? I'm thinking about Zora Neale Hurston, right? Mm -hmm. Speaking of letters to Du Bois. Right, and uh, her desire for a cemetery to celebrate what she called the illustrious Negro dead. Right, yeah. the idea that we would have a space set aside for the people who devoted their life and work to us and the preservation of our beauty. So I was wondering if y'all could share any, uh, any deep cuts, any sort of minor notes or uh, heroes of yours that maybe the people gathered here might wanna know a bit more about. And then can we do Q and A, is that all right? Am I allowed to do that? Oh, okay, I got a nod. I was expecting to shut it down, you know. Okay, cool. So we might have time for a couple questions too. But yes, please. This is not a, this is not a direct answer to that, but but I see how it holds hands. But am I right with the Zora Neale Hurston when when Alice Walker is looking for Zora Neale Hurston's grave, that she's she's calling her name, isn't she? Yes, as she walks through the field. As she walks through the field, and she's calling her name. I don't know that that's that's it's not a direct response, but that the like practice, that. the knowing how to do what you are told to do, the practice of that, the recovery mm -hmm. of that. Yes. Um, yeah. I love that. Please. Uh, for recovery, Zora Neale Hurston. I'm so glad you brought her up because Joanna 
and I, um, when we were in Portland this summer, we, we brought up Zora Neale Hurston, the story you told. And um, I think in terms of recovery, especially because we're in a public garden, that's the world that I work in. And in that letter she writes to Du Bois, she's, she describes, she says, this cemetery should look like Bach Tower mm -hmm. Garden in Florida. And she starts describing the landscape. But if you go to Bach Tower's uh, website, they don't mention this. And I'm like, Zora Neale Hurston was not only in your garden, she's advocating for it to be a model of what um, the elite um, black intellects and thinks of their time were. So we have to recover those things. And, and I feel like public gardens, these spaces, maybe that's where your exhibit goes next. Mm. Um, Factually, <laughs> big facts. <laughs> um, so that's recovery because these are things people need to know. And to add to that, her just being deeply in love with nature, growing up on those five acres in Eatonville, growing up just free and black in this all black town, and her own sister-in-law, mm -hmm. Blanche King Hurston, her oldest brother married a woman named Blanche King from Jacksonville mm -hmm. who owned a flower farm. And her daddy, who was a head gardener, ran her flower farm. And this is a black woman that was so wealthy with her a florist business, her, her, her nursery that she's running. She has a chauffeur. Mm -hmm. And these are things that are all just in Zora Neale Hurston's orbit. We haven't even got to her relationship with Du Bois. So it's just such a connection. It's mm -hmm. a, a constellation, I think, if you will. And I think we have to, the constellation is there. Those stars are there yes. for us to just connect the dots. And, yeah. um, and they'll be there for us forever. And it's yeah. really amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, hold on. I feel like y'all took me to a different place. Can we get metaphysical real quick? Y'all got me thinking about George Washington Carver. OK. Y'all know George Washington Carver? Inventor peanut butter. Somebody said, hell yeah. Wow, I love that. I've never heard that response when asked about a black scientist. That's great. OK. George Washington Carver, inventor peanut butter, peanut shampoo, many uses for the peanut, right? But when he was asked about the cultivation of, of peanuts, right, he said that they called out to him, right? She feels like a kind of inverse of, of Walker in the field trying to call out to Zora, right? He said they, they called out to him and they, they told him how to grow peanuts, right? He would describe the woods as, I uh, called it God's radio, right? So I wanted to talk to you both for a bit too, because it's so interesting, Abra, in your, in, in your presentation, and even what you're saying now, I'm hearing the, the mystical in the background. And often when I speak publicly about this kind of stuff, I think I let that fall out. Like when Clifton talks about the bond of live things everywhere, she might be talking about genes, right? Right, and the kind of the strands we share with that, right? We're like 33% daffodil or something like this, right? But I think she's also talking when she's in that kitchen with those greens and that knife and the room, you know, twists dark on its spine. That bond of live things everywhere, I think is also something higher, something that has to do with the stars. So I was wondering if you could talk about uh, the role of the, the mystical or the unsayable in your work and what you love to read and, and teach. I'm just curious. I imagine out in the landscape, there must just be things you see and hear and encounter in the literature um, that speak to you, that maybe often don't feel like they have a place on stages like this or in our, our classrooms and presentations. We can skip that, too. We come back to it. We'll talk about it later. And if anyone has questions after this, please raise your hand. And I can hand the microphone out, maybe? OK. I'll just toss it on the stage. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's central. I mean, when I, I wrote my dissertation uh, on animals in African American literature and her book, I mean, of course, Temple of the Familiar is up there, but also the Chicken Chronicles, which I feel like people don't know a lot about. It's about her relationship to her chickens. Um, and it was one of the first times, again, I'd seen this like eminent black writer who I held in such high esteem, in part because of the awards. And I grew up watching The Color Purple and reading it. But it was the first time I think I'd seen a black writer deeply embrace their relationship to the non-human in a way that didn't even bring like the pathological stuff in the room. And I'd never felt the freedom to do that, to think about my grandparents who met in a strawberry field as sharecroppers, as teenagers. And that was the condition of possibility for my family, mm -hmm. right? And whenever I heard her talk about the strawberry field, it was about the strawberry field. 
And I get that sensibility in Walker's work, <laughs> right? Like the, the struggle is always there, right? But it's not always center stage. Like we really can sit with the, the chickens and the petunias and the lions, because there are fierce animals in her work too. And I think her willingness to embrace that really is uh, educational for the rest of us. But I don't know if y'all have something you want to say about Walker or, I mean, that's a great place to talk about the mystical too, I think. But. I think um, when I think about Alice Walker, um, Ann Spencer, m myself, I, when we talk about recovery, black rural Southern women, and if you've been to Lynchburg, Virginia, where Ann Spencer's home, it is rural Virginia. It is mm -hmm. not the DC side of things. Um, that's something we haven't even scratched the surface on, these black women born in rural, deep, dirt road country places. Yes. Regardless of how long they stay there, Zora Neale Hurston, something about those spaces that comes out. I mean, even if some of the best writing, some of the best authors come out of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. about, and I think that there is something that is that happens there mm -hmm. to you. And I, the, even my own journey, it wasn't Auburn or growing up in Atlanta. It was Barnesville that has gotten me on this stage with you. Like that understanding mm -hmm. of this farm that my great grandfather built and his mother was born into slavery so it's something that's powerful you can't explain it yeah. but it it takes you it carries you and it's something that empowers you um and i don't i just don't think that with nature with recovery with with those spaces enough has been studied there um for people from those places i love that mm -hmm. um i'm i'm thinking about Gwendolyn Brooks and Lucille Clifton as two people who, um, I mean, we talked about Lucille Clifton, but I've been thinking about her a lot because of the lantern bugs, lantern flies, lantern bugs, and how um, when we see him in the street or on the, you know, I live in Brooklyn and you hear, you see people going to get them or I have gone to get them and each time I'm like, and I tell my kids, you know, you're, kill, you're killing it. Like you feel like, feel sorry and I keep hearing and I'm also suspicious I'm also like the the ease of the running after it just I, I'm very suspicious of um, um, which that suspicion I keep hearing Lucille Clifton talking about the cockroaches and how she says she has to watch herself whenever she enters the room yeah. because you know ever since she killed the cockroaches with her mother but she, she has to keep an eye on herself yeah. for the cruelty um, the ease with which X, Y, Z. I'm thinking about that, and, I'm, and then I'm also, that's holding hands with Gwendolyn Brooks, yes. um, Maude Martha, with the, with the mouse. With the yeah, mouse. the mouse, and she's got this, the, the Mod Martha, the character, there's a mouse in the kitchen, and there's this thing happening between them and seeing the mouse, you know, trying to, trying to live. Um, these, these ways that I think, um, I, when I think about myself as a young person and and growing up in a pretty in a city slash suburban place, Santa Ana, um, there was so much that was just like these empty lots around us, and I was so drawn to the dirt and playing in the dirt and digging in the dirt. But I think part of it was because I knew my family was not from there. There was Chicago before that and Georgia before that. There was Puerto Rico, there was Eritrea. And so there was this feeling of these parallels. Mm. And I think part of my loss and what I was trying to recover and have been trying to recover is um, a relationship to those lands, which are far, were far, and those land practices, mm. which then you, it's like that listening, like in, in the absence of that, with that in the distance, what can I listen to that will help me feel closer to both where I am, but, but where, what those relationships were. Like yes. it feels like a trying to like lean into some kind of ancestral listening, but it's also full of loss and full of pain, mm. pain and pain. Um, but, and I, and I think, like thinking of the elders, the lavender, that the lavender is my elder, Lucille Clifton is my elder, Gwendolyn Brooks. But you start to, in the absence of your elders, some of your elders, you. I started to realize, oh, you too, right? Yeah. You are my elders. You are my mothers. The green grass of of Gremke. Yeah. 
Is that Raymond Williams? That tradition is uh, like the selection and reselection of ancestors. Is that right, Sonia? I'm looking at you for some reason for confirmation. I think that's right. We could check that citation later. You're making me think too about Nikki Giovanni and that poem she has about spiders, allowables. Like that Maud Martha scene. Oh, okay. I got to send you this. I'm going to email you that after this. Um, but it's a poem about spiders, and it basically ends with, I don't think I'm allowed to kill something because I'm afraid, mm. right? And that's what we see in Lucille Clifton's Cruelty, and that's also what we see in her poem, The Beginning of the End of the World, where the atomic bomb goes off outside, and she says the, uh, the cockroaches stand up like priests, and they march in a long line away after looking at the humans in shame because they will survive, right? And then you got that Audre Lorde poem, Brown Menace, or poem to the survival of roaches, which if you hear her interview about that poem, it's a persona poem about cockroaches. And you're thinking, well, why would this sister write a persona poem about cockroaches? And some of it, it's a New York City story, right? She's on the train as a little girl. And she says this woman, this white woman next to her, jumped up from her seat and said, the, the seat is covered with cockroaches, right? And Lord was there as a little girl, and there were no cockroaches there. And this deep shame that she just felt in that moment, thinking, was I the kind of source of this pestilential fear? Mm -hmm. And so I think what we see is this shimmering thread through these poems is not just recovery, but a kind of recognition mm -hmm. of what it means to be seen not in the fullness of what you are, but as some kind of violent abstraction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I often think, not just what rigorous imagination, but what grace for these black writers who could so easily say, I have nothing to do with the land. I have nothing to do with animals, and there is no use to flowers, right? How easy would it be instead to embrace a kind of more dominant colonial vision of a relationship to the land? And instead, what do they do? They talking to peanuts, right? They're claiming rural space, right? Zora Neale Hurston talks about, you know, being the universal feminine with its string of beads in the middle of the street, right? Straight out of Eatonville. So I think there's, there's something there about the embrace um, of what we've been taught to fear and denigrate. That's so beautiful that I come back to in this literature time and time again. Do we have any questions from the audience? I'm, we could do this all day, I'm so excited. I never get to talk about this stuff, this is fun. And if not, I think we can close. Joanne, are we good on time? Y'all, can we have, oh please, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I was gonna say, there's a lot to admire about um, all of you. In particular, you, Joshua, you have an uh, amazing academic uh, journey uh, and development journey as far as how you uh, become a better poet. And uh, I just wanna know, at the times in which you guys like almost like doubted yourselves or you know uh, found struggle um, almost insurmountable, right. how did you overcome that and um, make it to where you are today? Well, I'll share my journey. I was not a good student in college. I actually failed out of Auburn at one point and was on academic suspension and went back and finished. So I was out of school for a semester. So um, I share that because sometimes people think when you, you fail, that's just the end, and it's, it's just not true. Um, if anything, it makes me not scared to try things now. Yes. But most important, I remember um, when I went back to Auburn and I'm, I'm studying deeply, learning all this horticulture, we had gone back to Barnesville one weekend and um, my Aunt Lois was out there in the yard and she said something about her rose bush and I said, oh, that's not a bush, it's a shrub. And, <laughs> and my Aunt Lois, my mom, everybody just looked at me like, and so my mom was like, you haven't learned anything at this school, have you? And it was, <laughs> It was the audacity of me as a 20-year-old talking to my Aunt Lois, who was in her 80s, that grew up on a farm that her daddy built, yeah. to tell her right. that it was a shrub because I had learned that at Auburn in the ag department versus a bush. And I say that because my mom wanted me to know who the real horticulturist in the room was, right? Mm. Just because I had the privilege that my parents paid for me to go to Auburn. She was like, the, these are the real yeah. You will never out garden me. You will never out agriculture me. So I say that because you can teach yourself these things and just don't ever forget. And this is not me knocking academia. I, I respect it. I, I deeply um, care for it. I learn from it. But just don't forget that a self taught person, a self taught elder, in, in many cases, maybe even most, if not all, it is the most wise. So mm. just know that that's, yes. that's a way. That is a path. Thank you. I love that. Yeah, my story is a, is a grad school story. You know, when I, uh, 
when I got to grad school, I was told that uh, poetry was a distraction. And I needed to sit in the library for 12 hours a day to be a serious literary critic that people would take seriously. And uh, I'd come in there doing, you know, I'm a self-taught poet. I have a degree in poetry. Um, I started out in the world of a spoken word and poetry slam and uh, my grandmother's living room in the South Bronx where uh, every Christmas, all the little kids had to perform. So you could do anything. You could do Bobby Brown choreography. You know, you could sing a song. And uh, my thing was always the memorization of poems. And I think in that moment, where people I'd actually come there to work with had told me the thing that was most beautiful to me in all of literature was nothing, right? It was dirt. It was this, uh, this hippity-hoppity thing I needed to leave outside of the, the ivory tower, right? It was actually going back to those memories of those Christmas mornings. And it was sitting in the library, but not in the part they told me to sit in, right? The contemporary poetry section, reading uh, many of the poets gathered here today, but also Thylias Moss, right? Also Gwendolyn Brooks, also Alice Walker, right? And sitting with those poets and realizing not only that I could teach myself this tradition in my own way, but also that I'd already been taught by ancestors without thinking of it that way, right? That my, my grandmother, had Harlem Renaissance poets memorized, right? So I already, I didn't have to go to Princeton to get McKay, right, and Dunbar and Cullen, right, and Spencer. That was already in the air. That was in my imagination. That was how I got to even uh, write the prose on the application to get there, right? And I'd suppressed it in part because um, I'd been deceived into to worshiping this kind of elite dominant space. Well, what I really needed to do was uh, go back to the ground uh, of my youth and the elders who uh, know, know what poetry is, right? They know the foundations of the thing. So that was how I overcame that, you know, by listening to the, the whispers. And my grandma doesn't really, she never really yelled at me, right? Even in, in life, she always had a quiet voice. And now that she's passed, may she rest. I think she still, she still whispers to me. Um, and that encouragement is how I overcome each day. Um, I, thank you. I'm, I feel... Um, so nourished by this conversation and your question, um, which doubt I, I still I, I carry all the time, um, sometimes more than others. And after my kids were born, a lot of fear that that felt differently new to me. Um, and then when I began to take my notes, not to share with other people, but to live. Um, and then I looked back on them, I thought, hmm, and I still wonder, I don't know if this is a communicable thing. Um, this feels like the closest I'm getting to uh, an inner marrow voice or spirit, and I don't know that it's a shareable thing. Um, all of which is to say, at different moments, I've carried those, those questions and doubts, but I think it's been helpful for me um, to open up to try to see inside of the doubt what what is it made of and how often it's made of um, other people's priorities which are not necessarily mine right and the the importance of I'm thinking about my I mean growing up and watching my my mom and her sister and I have this vision that I was so embarrassed of as a child and now I'm like it's amazing they would practice salsa routines in the park they, like my mom would act out the part of one character and, my, and I was just like horrified because I was very shy and I was like, oh, they are all extensions of me and I'm dancing in the part. Um, and when I look back, I think of like that they, the, their geniuses, their, their genius of like making music and this skit and this was the place that they could do it in and that like everybody, everybody has, are, you are all our teachers. We are each other's teachers, right? And that the, the, the idea of this person has the things that are this to say, the, the smart things to say, and this one has nothing to say. Like All of that is a lie. So we might as well tr keep trying and learning and figuring it out. And what you said, it's not, it's not fail failure is not an end, no. right? Um, but yeah, it's, I appreciate it. It's a question. It's a conversation I keep having with myself, with my children. Yeah. You know, um, but the willingness to tr willingness to try um, feels like the biggest thing. The biggest thing I want them to have in their pockets. You just keep trying. Yeah. You just keep trying.
and a beautiful note to close. Could we have one more round of applause for our panelists, Avery and Alcides? How y'all doing? Y'all still with us? Oh, I need a little bit more energy than that. Y'all all right? Y'all still with us? All right. Fantastic. One more panel, then we're off to the party, which will be fun. All right. So for our second panel, The Earth is a Living Thing, we will have three esteemed writers share with us in this order. First up will be Leah Penniman, who is a black Creole farmer, author, mother, and food justice activist who has been tending the soil and organizing for an anti-racist food system for 25 years. She currently serves as founding co-ED and farm director of Soul Fire Farm in Grafton, New York, a black and brown led project that works toward food and land justice. Her books are Farming While Black, Soul Fire Farm's Practical Guide to Liberation on the Land, come on title, and Black Earth Wisdom, Soulful Conversations with Black Environmentalists. All right, our second speaker will be my longtime friend, Sonia Posmentier, who is an associate professor at the Department of English at New York University, where she teaches African-American and Black diasporic literature and culture, poetry and poetics, and environmental literature. Her first book, the classic, Cultivation and Catastrophe, The Lyric Ecology of Modern Black Literature, was published in 2017 by Johns Hopkins University Press and is a recipient of the William Sanders Scarborough Award from the Modern Language Association. And this isn't in the bio, but that's the award for the top book in black literary studies in a given year. So shout out to Sonia, doing your thing. And lastly, you'll hear from Terrence Hayes, whose most recent publications include American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin and To Float in the Space Between, Drawings and Essays in Conversation with Etheridge Knight. To Float in the Space Between was a winner of the Poetry Foundation's 2019 Pegasus Award for Poetry, Criticism, and a finalist for the 2018 National Book Critics Circle Award in Criticism. Y'all, can we have another round of applause for our first speaker, Leah Penningham. Peace family, so good to be here with all of you. I am Leah Penniman. I am the farmer uh, and co-director at Soul Fire Farm in Mohican Territory, Grafton, New York, author, and also a practicing member of clergy in West African indigenous Orisha tradition for over 20 years. So I wish I could bring you all to my farm. In lieu of that, I'm gonna ask our wonderful friends up here to just put this on slideshow so we can have a virtual field trip while I talk about the Afro-Indigenous legacy of earth listening upon which Soul Fire Farm is built. Our ancestral grandmothers in West Africa braided seeds of black rice, okra, molokia, levant cotton into their hair being, before being forced into the bowels of transatlantic slave ships. They hid sesame, black-eyed pea, and melon seed in their locks. They stashed away amara, kale, gourd, sorrel, basil, tamarind, and cola in their tresses. The seed was their most precious legacy, and they believed against odds in a future of tilling and reaping the earth. They believed that we, their descendants, would exist to inherit that seed, honor, and pass on. But what a lot of folks don't know is along with the seed, they braided their ecosystemic and cultural knowledge of right relationship with the earth. Examples include the wisdom of how to share the land, like the Husa farm co-op system of the Krobo people. They braided the wisdom of sharing labor and wealth, such as the Dokwe worker cooperatives of the Dahomey people and the Susu credit unions across West Africa. They braided the wisdom of caring for the sacred earth, the living being of the sacred earth, including the dark earth compost of the women of Ghana, the raised beds of the Ovambo people that concentrated fertility, the polycultures of Nigeria, the water worshiping practices of the Bantu people, and the sacred grove protection practices of the Akan. But of course, when our ancestors arrived on this continent, they tragically encountered a very different system of relating to land and food, where both black land and black people were depersoned. 
exploited, extracted for profit. We know the examples. We know settler colonialism, chattel slavery, sharecropping, convict leasing, the burning of black property, the theft of land, the discrimination by the USDA, and on and on. And at the same time, paralleling the exploitation of black and indigenous people was the exploitation of the earth. Within just one generation of white settlers farming the Great Plains, they had destroyed 50% of the organic matter in the soil. They had burned 50% of the carbon out of the soil, throwing it up into the atmosphere, which was the primary and principal driver of anthropogenic climate change in its early round. And I think Wendell Berry, um, put it perhaps best when he said, the white man preoccupied with the abstractions of the economic exploitation and ownership of the land necessarily has lived on the country as a destructive force and ecological catastrophe because he assigned the hand labor and in that the possibility of intimate knowledge of the land to a people he considered racially inferior. In thus debasing labor, he destroyed the possibility of meaningful contact with the earth. He was literally blinded by his presuppositions and prejudices because he did not know the land. It was inevitable that he would squander its natural bounty, deplete its richness, corrupt and pollute it, or destroy it altogether. The history of the white man's use of the earth in America is a scandal. Despite the heartbreak and terror that our ancestors experienced, there were those in every generation who remembered the seeds that they had inherited and continued to pass on its wisdom. To name a few, the power of plants, both for somatic and spiritual healing, was remembered by the enslaved conjurers and herbalists like Caesar and Gullah Jack and Harriet Tubman. The memory of how to create land-based communal systems of shared labor in the wilds was remembered by the Maroons of the Great Dismal Swamp and the Black Freedmen in Walden Woods. The memory of how to study the earth so carefully as to have her whisper its secrets, secrets was remembered by ecological scientists like John Edmonston, Solomon Brown, and Charles Henry Turner. The memory of right relationship with the land that feeds us was remembered by Dr. George Washington Carver, one of the founders of regenerative and organic agriculture, and by Booker T. Watley, the progenitor of the farm to table movement and diversified small farms. The memory of cooperative land ownership and cooperative labor, labor were remembered by Fannie Lou Hamer in creating Freedom Farm in Mississippi with other sharecroppers and by the Sharads in creating the first ever land trust in this country in Georgia in 1969 by folks like Hattie Carthen, not too far from us here. The memory of how to protect the earth, which first protected us, was remembered by earth advocates like John Francis Planet Walker, Hazel Johnson, and Dolly Burwell and on and on. So when I started farming 25 years ago as a teenager, I began to wonder what it would be like to create a farming community that honored the legacy of the seeds that were braided into our ancestors' hair. How do we create a farming community that carries and passes on the wisdom of those seeds? So in 2010, Soulfire Farm was born with a mission to reclaim our ancestral belonging to land and to end racism and exploitation in the food system, tall order. Once a family farm and now a community farm, committed to that vision of uprooting racism and seeding sovereignty, we pray and continue to pray that the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, and the work of our hands be acceptable to our grandmothers who braided those seeds. Together, we're regenerating 80 acres of land through Afro-Indigenous Afro farming and forestry practices, and have now restored the soil to its pre-colonial levels of organic matter. Every calorie and nutrient that we harvest from the land is delivered at no cost to the doorsteps of people impacted by state violence, mass incarceration, supporting families and building their own self-sufficiency gardens, neighbors pitching in to the cover, cover the cost of those vegetable deliveries to those in need, allowing hundreds of people to receive a weekly share of fresh free local food. We're creating natural buildings using the very straw, the very clay, the very cob, the very sun of the earth cluster developed for efficiency and to leave most of that acreage for the wildlife. We're owning land cooperatively like the Husa systems of the Crobo, giving nature a veto power on our council returning land rights to the Mohican people through cultural respect, easements, and friendship. 
equipping the next generation of black and brown farmers through training and mentorship and connection to resources, attending to the needs of our youth to heal through the voices of their ancestors whispered through their bare feet on the land, partnering to adjust, address generational trauma from the centuries of land-based oppression. As, as Chris Bolden Newsom, a black farmer in Philadelphia, says the, the land was the scene of the crime. But I would add she was never the criminal. In fact, she was probably the reason we made it. Thousands of new black and brown farmers and food justice activists from all 50 states and four countries have come to Soul Fire Farm to learn how to carry forward those seeds and how to do that in a way that engages with our ancestral practices of honoring and celebrating the earth as our elder sibling. Humans weren't first. The hawks, the mountains, the wind, the clouds, the babbling brook, the daffodil, they are our elder siblings to whom we own. We owe deference, respect, and listening. This is the practice, the revival of the practice of ecological humility. And our alumni are moving and shaking, creating national land trust, new legislation. And for the first time in 100 years, we're seeing the slightest increase in the census in the number of black farmers, thanks to our wider community. So when I lived in Ghana, West Africa, studying farming as a, a young person in my early 20s, uh, the queen mothers who mentored me challenged me one day saying, you know, is it true that in the United States a farmer will uh, put a seed in the ground and they won't pray, they won't dance, they won't sing, they won't pour libation, they won't say thank you, they won't even listen to the earth, and then they expect that seed to grow and feed and nourish them. And when I admitted that was almost universally true. They said, well, that's why you're all sick. You're all sick because you treat the earth as a commodity and not as a living thing. Dr. George Washington Carver did listen to peanuts. He said, um, I love to think of nature as unlimited broadcasting stations through which God speaks to us every day, every hour. And then later said, how do I talk to a little flower through it I talk to the infinite. My prayer is that we wake up to being able to listen again to the earth, to the flower, to the infinite. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, it's already been such a wonderful morning. Um, so Josh invited us to offer meditation on black ecological thought or meditations on one or more of the poems um, lining the wetland trail. Um, and as I set out to do this, I found myself coming back over and over again to the wetland itself as a poem and with poems and to the water um, without which um, neither the gardens nor we would be here. Um, so this is a meditation on the wetland trail. And I wrote it for my friend, the Pakistani American scholar and poet Anjali Raza Kolb, um, with whom a lot of these ideas have come into being. Oh, clicker. Wetland trail. Epigraph, Edouard Glissant, Nesaline, 1967. Description of an island fully removed from the world, rocks in chaos or crouching, grain of the sea, scorched winds. Unto the secret fracture that each man suffers and of which, outside of his unremembered dream, he never follows the trace, but with the fingers of words. They called a hurricane what was a cyclone, thus they smother a share of their responsibility. A hurricane needn't be announced, and it is not so terrible. The rigors of our climate are not continuously excessive, but when violence is unleashed, it breaks. More than anything, the slow resignation of the disaster victims. It is clear to me that our country covers itself with its true face that the dull leprosy that gnaws at us, suddenly lifted by the waters, appears. 
It is always the destitute people whom the mud uproots. After these floods, there is no water left to soak the rags, nor to give men drink. It doesn't rain derision, and the dry plague besieges. It took four days for the authorities to think that it might be possible to feed the pumps with seawater, the inexhaustible sea that encircles and enjoins us to clean up some of these ravages. But it is impossible to use the sea. One, desperate islands. Villages are now desperate islands, not far from the part of the world where my mother was born in 1944, Lahore, Pakistan, called then by another name because it isn't only floods that make an island. We live on an island now. I'm reading the newspaper in New York. Even the goats are sick, he said. I don't want to live in the tents, he said. Home is home. Where schools were now canals. For what does a desperate island long? For the melted glacier? We're all underwater now. For air? Swamped. I seek reflections in the poems, but all my reflection is in the wetland trail. What is a wetland? The placard on the trail says usually low-lying areas where water covers the ground above or near the surface of the soil. Cat Tails, bald cypress, sweet gum, willow, red twig, dogwood, arrowhearts, willow, dawn redwood, coastal sweet pepperbush, upright sedge, pin oak, New York ironweed, white wood aster, spotted water hemlock, cuckoo flower, American elm, hickory, southern arrowwood, common winterberry, white snake root, black willow, sharp stipule willow, yellow twig dogwood, white oak, flowering dogwood, Pennsylvania sedge, broadleaf goldenrod, birch, variegated Norway maple, crimson-eyed rose mallow, giant redwood, sensitive fern. What is a wetland? Mangrove forest, submerged or otherwise, rich with mollusks and crabs, with stock of fish and overhead migratory birds, a swamp, a buffer, protection from the coastal squeeze, what is a wetland? The peatland in Chitral staving off glaciers melt. What is a wetland? It is the great dismal swamp where Nat Turner plotted and Henry Blake planted among conjurers, quote, to go scattering to the winds and sowing the seeds of a future crop, only to take root in the thick black waters which cover it. Three, we need a wetland. In August, as villages in Sindh became islands, we took our children to Venice to go scattering to the winds and sowing the seeds of a future crop, left the rental car on the mainland and rode the Vaporetto, packed and masked to Rialto, only to take root. What's the Wi-Fi password was, as usual, the first question the children asked. But the internet wasn't working. There was a citywide blackout two days ago, the woman at the front desk told me, and things have been weird ever since. All the art we see in Venice is about the Earth's undoing in the thick black waters which cover it. Of Venice, we said, it's good you have a chance to see it now before it is underwater. We are underwater. Four, underwater. As if to say, villages are now desperate islands. The artist Sarah Cameron Sundy stands in the water. Wednesday, September 14th, 2022, just this week, she enters the New York estuary at Hallett's Cove at 7.27 AM, waits, sometimes with others, until she's underwater up to her neck, and then for the rest of the full tidal cycle. I come by ferry to see the installation, and from the river, the people dotted along the shore seem so still they might be rooted there. Cattail, willow, sensitive fern. Are we the wetland? 
Sunday says, I invite you to join me in the water, clothed, silent, still, stay long enough to feel the shift, asterisk. The image we are creating is of people in urban spaces who are unprepared to face the sea level rise. From the shore, on the sidewalk, behind the cove, unprepared to face the sea level rise, I can see the waders move, scratching their heads or shaking out a sleeping foot. The geese know to steer clear. We are the swamp. Four teenage girls stand next to me, having happened on the scene, unprepared to face the sea level rise. Why are they standing there, one of them asks, brash and giggly. A docent responds, a full title cycle to show the sea rising. I have questions, the girl continues. Can the artist eat and drink? Only water. What if she needs to go to the bathroom? She's learned to hold it. Can anyone stand with her in the water? Yes. And then her friend asks, is it a ritual? Who are they summoning? A little later, an MTA worker passes behind the scene, unprepared to face the sea level rise, and one of the teens shouts down to him to compliment his boots. Nice, Tims, she calls out, and then laughing a little as if daring the waiters to look her way. Black power, then all four together summoning. Black power, black power, black power. Villages are islands. Five, we are a wetland. I don't know if I can make this play while I talk. After Hurricane Hugo hit St. Croix in 1989, the poet Audre Lorde, who had moved to the island, kept a journal. Two days later, a dear friend, Bob, appeared from up north with supplies collected for our families and friends off island. Batteries, a chainsaw, canned and dried foods, first aid supplies, and a delicious home-cooked meal. For the next month or so, we shared our collard greens, which is the only vegetable in the garden not destroyed by Hugo, along with the food, supplies, and care packages sent to us from the mainland by our families, friends, and strangers. Since not one visible banana tree survived the storm here, the Caribbean island of St. Lucia sends the gift of a boatload of ripe bananas to the people of St. Croix. On Saturday, the wharf at Gallows Bay is filled with people picking up their bunches of bananas, many, many seeing each other for the first time since Hugo, remembering how that first yellow banana from St. Lucia tasted three weeks after Hugo still brings tears to my eyes. We need a wetland, Lord reminds us. Not only floods make an island. Need be a wetland. Cattail, mangrove, mangrove, peatland, we. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Hey. Thanks, Sonia. This has been great. Uh, I mean, really, I just brought initially three poems, but I'm like, that's going to be fast so I can read them slow. And then if I go super fast, maybe I could read something else. What I really want to say is, you know, uh, the land is everywhere. I don't know how it can be in the work. Um, so what I really did was I, thinking about y'all, dug up these two American sonnets starring Octavia Butler. And uh, now I think I'm going to put them in the book. So I've been messing around with them. So I'll read those, those two. And then this other poem, and I think we can just, we'll talk. Uh, but I've been editing these things. So they weren't, you know, they weren't going to be in this book that's coming out, but maybe the order's wrong too. And they could be terrible. But uh, we'll start out with them. Two American sonnets for Octavia Butler. In Julie Dash's Octavia Butler, the director washes Octavia's monumental feet and toenails in buckets of government water when there are no seas or rivers handy. It takes too long awaiting God's rain, but there are open barrels outside the camera's frame in the scene where Butler lies outdoors, letting her entire mouth fill with water and then spitting the water into rain, blessed and better with her taste. If you don't see suffering's potential as art, will it remain suffering? 
When Butler tells Dash she's dreamed of storms all week, Dash asks to film the dreams. The camera watches Butler sleep and huh and hmm, something in the same baritone she uses when she speaks. Hmm, 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 huh, huh, huh. Of course, Octavia Butler stars in Octavia Butler. She buys blouses with patterns of leaves and flowers in the off hours and listens to the young hotel clerk worry about precipitous weather. Okay, I had forgotten about these things. You know, I'd just be like writing them and uh... So I must have, I must have written them together or something because this one's uh, Octavia Butler with Gordon Parks. In Gordon Parks, Octavia Butler, Gordon Parks shy Octavia in Central Park and shoots her against the stars beginning, beginning to burn between the leaves some twilight evening in the 60s. She's big and nearly as quiet as the trees and the policemen hovering over the scene. Parks shoots her near the biggest, quietest tree, leaning into its shade, then clutching a hatchet, and then transformed into a small blackbird perched in its branches. Rain makes the bark appear to be sweating. The surface of everything seems to be crying over the conversation. They talk the wormholes between capitalism and spirituality, the manholes between building and property, the loopholes between hairstyles and thinking caps. But when asked about the banter shared during their time together, Butler and Parks recall different things. If you see suffering's potential as art, is it art or suffering? If you see life's potential as art, is it artful or artificial living? Okay. Uh, yeah, a lot of conversation, I think, uh, can be sort of used to frame this poem. Pseudicus Crucifer, I'll just say, uh, is for my now 19-year-old son who's doing something down in the city right now. Um, Obviously, you'll see sort of like the landscape, the stuff that's in it. But I'll, I'll say, you know what? I'll say this like the other poem. Like what I really wanted to do was make the noise of Octavia Butler sleeping. So I wrote that whole poem so I could be like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and here, you know, I was just trying to, um, it's, it's just come out of the conversation today, explain something to my son that he had forgotten. Like when he was really young, four, we took this trip down south, I'm from South Carolina, and we were in the flea market, and at the same time he had just gone through this phase where he was like obsessed with the harmonica. So he was, he was really a good harmonica player when he was four years old. And you know, um, I had just initially wrote the poem just to kind of say to him, like a parent sort of knows things that the kid forgets sometimes, like there's this thing that you have forgotten about yourself that I know. So I wrote this poem, it was like for his 15th birthday, but I think it's, you know, as I said, because it's South and because of the things that happened, it was really the poem that I thought I would share with y'all today. Pseudocris Crucifer. The father begins to make the sound a tree frog makes when he comes with his son and daughter to a pail of tree frogs for sale in a deep south flea market just before the last blood of dusk. A tree frog is called a tree frog because it chirps like a bird in a tree, he tells his daughter, while her little brother, barely four years old, busies himself like a small blues piper with a brand new birthday harmonica. A single tree frog can sound like a sleigh bell, the father says. Several can sound like a choir of crickets. Once in high school, as I dissected a frog, the frog opened its eyes to judge its deconstruction, its disassembly, my scooping and poking at its soul. And the little girl's eyes go wide as a tree frog's eyes. Some call it the spring peeper. In Latin, it's called Pseudocris Crucifer, false locust. 
toads with falsettos, their chimes issuing below the low leaves and petals. The harmonica playing is so otherworldly, the boy blows with his eyes closed. Some tree frog species spend most every day underground. They don't know what sunlight does at dusk. They are nocturnal insectivores, no bigger than a green thumb. They are the first frogs to sing in the spring. They may sound like crickets only because they eat so many crickets. <laughs> tree frogs mostly sound like birds. The tree frog overcomes its fear of birds by singing. The harmonica playing is so bewitching, the boy gathers a crowd in the flea market in the deep south. A bird may eat a tree frog. A fox may eat the bird. A wolf may eat the fox. And then the wolf may carry varieties of music and cunning in its belly as it roams the countryside. A wolf hungers because it cannot feel the good in its body. The people clap and gather round with fangs and smiles. The father lifts the son to his shoulders so the boy's harmonics hover over varieties of affections, varieties of bodies with their, box, with their backs to a firmament burning and opening. You can find damn near anything in a flea market. Pets, weapons, flags, farm fresh as well as farm spoiled fruits and vegetables, varieties of old wardrobes, a tiny, old tin box with old postcards and old photos of lynchings dusted in the rust of the box. You can feel it on the tips of your fingers, this rust, which is almost as brown as the father and the boy on his shoulders, and the girl making the sound a tree frog makes in a flea market in the deep south before the last blood of dusk, just before the last blood of dusk just before the dusk. Uh, and here's one more, just because as I said, I just think it's, you know, it's everywhere. What I think about, you know, growing up in the South is that there was a horse ranch or farm up one hill, there was a cow farm down the other, and there was a creek nearby. And I really didn't pay any attention to all of it. I just went out and played in it. Um, so a lot of my adulthood and a lot of my time measuring the distance from where I grew up to here is thinking about seeing those things that were just there for me to see always and not seeing them. So it just, it's always there. So I just think that my bank of imagery is the land. And so I'll just read y'all this last poem, but I wasn't going to read it. But it's George Floyd. That's the title of it. And uh, as I said, the land is just everywhere, no matter what's happening. We're always close to it. George Floyd. You can be a bother who dyes his hair, Dennis Rodman, blue in the face of the man kneeling and blue in the face, the music of his wrist. Watch your mouth is little more than a door being knocked out of the ring of fire around the afternoon came evenings, bell of the ball and chain around the neck of the unarmed brother ground down to gunpowder. Dirt can be inhaled like a puffed magic bullet point of transformation, both kills and fires the life of the party like it's 1999 bottles of beer on the Wall Street. People who sleep in the streets do not sleep without counting yourself lucky rabbits foot of the mountain lion do not sleep without making your bed of the riverboat gambling there will be no stormy weather on the water bored to death means killing time is on your side of the bed of the truck transporting emmet till the break of day emmet till the river runs dry your face the music of the spheres emmet till the end of time thank y'all thank y'all for rocking with us I want to begin by talking about uh, ancestors, okay? And the relationship for you all between uh, ancestors and poesis. I want to take Aristelis' caution seriously against just talking about genre. So whenever you go to make what you make, what ancestors are in the room? What ancestors that you've read or spent time with or listened to do you feel like are calling you when it's time to work, whether it's in the field or on the page or in the classroom? I just talked, so I think you should. <laughs> People who have not talked for a while should talk first. 
I can talk first this time, but next time someone else can talk first. Um, one of the ancestors that comes to mind right away is uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. She's quite well known for her work with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the political work, less well known uh, for the land-based liberation work. And my all-time favorite thing she ever said is if you have 400 quarts of greens and gumbo soup canned up for the winter, no one can push you around or tell you what to say or do. And the organizers, the young activists she worked with really challenged her. She had peaches and greens, everything just canned, and she was working the land, and they thought it was a waste of time. You know, we need to step away from that. Get with the program, the urban program. And I think about that a lot because as soon as the grocery, grocery store shelves went empty in our communities um, in the pandemic and those who had previously been insulated from food insecurity were feeling the shakiness, it was abundantly clear that anybody in a heartbeat that I knew would put down you know, their metaphorical ballot, their NAACP membership, you know, their, their placard signs and go begging on their knees through the dust to feed their children. So if you don't actually have the means of production in your community, you're fundamentally vulnerable to enslavement again, right? And so that idea that, that land is, is the basis of revolution, as Malcolm X said, the basis of freedom, liberation, and equality, that's not a metaphor, that's actuality. And right now in our country, 98% of the land is white owned, which is higher than ever. And we, we're asleep at the wheel on that. We are asleep at the wheel. So you think Amazon and Google and TIA, they care? They care about your children getting enough food? We have to take it back. And so I think about her all the time and that fundamental imperative um, to take land beyond a metaphor and, and really back into the hands of our own community. follow that. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, I think, um, I guess I will say that um, something I've been thinking a lot about and that I was thinking about with this piece is um, trying the, the dangers and the possibilities of thinking analogically <laughs> about our relationship to the earth. So I am trying to process something that's happening in the part of the world that my ancestors come from in South Asia with the floods um, and thinking about the geographical necessities, the agricultural necessities of that place and processing that as a scholar of black poetry mm. and thinking about the, the resources for right living as you say, you know, that mm -hmm. come from that tradition and asking, you know, how actually um, connections across those um, geographical and cultural borders can emerge. Um, so that's something, I'm not sure if that's directly about ancestors, but it's something I'm trying to think about in terms of um, like history and the present. Sure. The first thing that came to my mind was just, uh, like libraries as where they are. Hmm. And then as y'all was talking, I was like, well, the forest, you know, if we're thinking about Alice Walker, the wandering, this is beloved as well, uh, finding the ancestors under the sky. This is what Baby Suggs wants to do, yeah. uh, where she holds church. So for me, I, my first answer is that, like I sort of feel like, you know, it's what I said about growing up where I grew up. I think you're mostly looking for the real ancestors because the other ones are kind of very present for you. So if I say, of course, Brooks, of course, Clifton, they're in front of me and my ancestors. But when I call out like Alice Walker, I'm also saying also, you know, those, the middle ground, those, those people who are not in the dirt yet and they're not seeds, but they've also done this kind of work. So when I say walking through the bookstore or walking through the forest, I am often like, who am I overlooking? Mm -hmm. This is the work around like Wanda Coleman or Etheridge Knight. Yeah. I'm usually thinking like, there's so many ancestors and like, how do you find the ancestors that you have lost is a deeper question for me than calling on the ones that you have access to. So 
Is that wandering through the library? Is that wandering through the woods? Is that coming to these moments and hearing these great new names and this great new work and, and, and meeting great new people and figuring out how that, that ancestral pool just keeps um, getting bigger? Oh, that's beautiful. And then finding ways, hopefully, to share that work with children. I feel like the voices of children was another through line uh, in all of your presentations. And one of the ancestors that's always with me has already come up, June Jordan. And she's well known, I think, for her program Poetry for the People at Berkeley. But what I think people don't realize is that started as a program called The Voice of the Children here uh, at the Church of the Open Door uh, in Brooklyn. And she had another site in Harlem. So I'm thinking, too, about the voices uh, of children. Why are they so central in not just your presentations, but in all of your work? You know, I'm hearing the children that sound like tree frogs or are playing their music, the children on the farm, and the children on the boat asking for Wi-Fi. I mean, why is that a key part of the practice for you all? I mean, you said it. You said it earlier when you were talking about losing that vulnerability, yeah. Yeah. forgetting a certain kind of power. I mean, that's, that's what I'm trying to tap into that. We are with their caretakers and they're ours. This, you said the thing about the future was just amazing. Is that June Jordan that said that? Children are coming from the future. So you answered that earlier and I just think we're trying to shrink the distance between like what we know and what they know, kids, sometimes. That's great. And I think too, they've been through something in these last few years, yeah. especially uh, an experience of disconnection. Um, that is like radical. Um, and yet there are, there are histories <laughs> um, to help them experience that. And so I feel like that maybe in this moment in terms of um, also childhood having that particular purchase. Mm. I was thinking about the, Terrence, what you just said too about choosing ancestors. And I was thinking about that moment of Alice Walker looking for Zora Neale Hurston's grave that if I remember correctly, she has to, when she goes to the town, she has to lie and mm -hmm. say that she's, she's Zora's right. niece, right? Yeah. And so that's also like this powerful thing about choosing a lineage that maybe, um, you know, is there spiritually. Mm. Wow, I mean, you have me all thinking about some of these actual youth that come out to the farm and um, more often than not, they're teenagers. So the world has already done a number on, on them. Mm. Uh, and a lot of young people will say things like, well, why would I bother to think about healthy food if I'm gonna get shot anyway? Or why would I really bother to be thinking about the environment if, it's, if incarceration is the future? So, you know, uh, this, this settler colonialism, this racial capitalism has, has really done a number on shrinking the world of possibility for so many of our youth. And, you know, not to oversimplify it, but it's been profound, absolutely profound, to see the power of the land and the earth to heal and to loosen the ties on that box a little bit. There's this one story I love to tell, I'll call this young man Kareem, um, that's not his actual name, but he, he's now grown, but he came to our farm first when he was 13 years old and he was not trying to get out of the van because he thought a bear would eat him. <laughs> and then he eventually got out of the van because everybody else had, and it's like, which is scarier? But then we're walking around the farm, it's like muddy, and he's got like brand new J's. Anyway, I was like, you can take your shoes off. And then, so long story short, these teens all end up taking their shoes off and no one is listening to the tour because they're squealing, there's worms and frogs jumping across their feet and snakes and I mean, the, the earth was doing the whole education. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember getting back to the, we do a little debrief after what you notice, the circle, and this child with tears in his eyes is like, this is gonna sound crazy, but my grandmother who passed away, um, speaking of ancestors, when a long, a long time ago, she came to me like, through my feet and reminded me that when I was little, we mm. used to garden and she would put insect in my hand and tell me it was okay, tell me I belong. Mm. And that memory and that belonging, that visceral connection to the earth was so softening. These boys, these like all these Albany kids start weeping and talking about their grandmothers and the earth <laughs> and the gardens and how they can make video tributes to their grandmas. You know. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think the earth has been longing, 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 longing for the laughter of her children, for the footsteps of her children, for us to come home, for us to listen finally to the messages that she's been calling out, but we just have too many layers of concrete between us and her in order to hear. And so that, um, that capacity to compost trauma into something else is like unbelievably abundant and ready 
yeah. um, ready for our children. You said composting trauma. Trauma, oh, yeah. Yeah, she had a couple yeah. bars in there. I want to linger. <laughs> trauma. It's got to be on a t-shirt, backpack. Come on, Botanical Garden, get on that. I want to I linger with something else you said, though, about shrinking the possibility of the world and how that's happening to our children in a moment of ongoing catastrophe. Right. Right, you all had catastrophe in your presentations too, right? Like Terrence, you closed with it, and I feel like you two opened with it, right? We started with the middle passage and the seeds that were braided into our ancestors' hair. We start with the hurricane, right, and the cyclone. What is our work in terms of helping our young people, helping our elders, helping ourselves navigate catastrophe? Can y'all talk about that for a bit? I mean, I'm just curious because it seems like the catastrophic came into all of your presentations, but it wasn't the end point. We didn't land there. And I don't know if it's a Baldwinian thing, right, where he says he's an optimist because fool tell the children there is no hope, right? Um, or June Jordan talks about optimism as like a fundamentally kind of black feminist practice because you got to wake up. Like, <laughs> there are people who depend on you, so optimism is something that's just kind of baked into your, your everyday living. What is the role of the catastrophic and what you're all working on? And uh, how does the work help you get elsewhere, whether it's through composting, that trauma, right? Whether it's through turning it into poems or maybe the ending can be different than the reality or whether it's just that quiet practice of listening and reading that we all love. And I'm gonna talk about music in a second, but I think maybe music is part of it too. Well, maybe I'll start since you mentioned the braiding seeds. I mean, the thing, yeah. when I think of moments of despair, because catastrophe is ever present, right? But the, the moments yeah. when it crushes the spirit, the moments mm -hmm. when you're like, but why? Am I doing this hard thing, like in the face of the gale? And there's two places I go. One is I do think about our ancestral grandmas who braided seeds because how on earth are you up against the despair of that kidnap, right. the ravage of your community, and you're, you're braiding some sor sorghum yeah. just in case, right? And so I think about the audacity of that hope and then I think about my own literal children who are now 19 and 17. Um, my daughter especially is like a, a very serious environmental and indigenous rights activist. And she comes to me from time to time of like, we ain't gonna win, mom. You know, mm. like I really, I don't see the evidence. And I remind her and in doing so remind myself that we may or may not, right, get to the proverbial promised land. We might even get to the mountaintop. But if we start behaving as if we already lost we know we're never gonna get there, one. And in the meantime, we're creating a world that absolutely sucks for us and everybody else. But if we start acting like we're gonna win, in the meantime, we're feeding our community today. Yes. We are putting carbon in the soil today. We are making a habitat for that hummingbird moth today, right? And so these, these incremental steps actually in and of themselves are victories, yes. you know? And, and if we give over to that despair, um, we've lost the future and the present. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think about that a lot. And also there are days when I'm like, it's hard, you know? Yeah. So we don't want to pretend that it's all like flowers. Right? Yeah. Um, so I have to write, you know, I go into my writing every morning and since my, my son has literally just moved in to try to do this gap year thing. So I mostly am writing about him every morning. So I'm going to do the two. <laughs> uh, just morning, I was saying, Perhaps joy is a kind of psychosis. Maybe optimism is psychotic. Because, you know, neuroses, this comes from Russell Brand. Neuroses is like uh, anxiety, yeah. deep anxiety if you're neurotic. Psychotic is a, an illusion of control. It's the opposite. Like a person that's a psychotic thinks they can control everything. So perhaps to maintain a certain kind of optimism, they will require more of a psychosis than a neurosis. That was just this morning's writing. Yesterday. <laughs> For my son, so he was still asleep, so I had to say it to him this evening. Right. Yesterday, I talked to him about what I had written yesterday morning, which was gravity was always gonna be a thing. It's a natural phenomenon everywhere on the planet. Yeah. So we're always being pulled to the center of the earth. Pandemic, war, you always are dealing with gravity. Mm -hmm. So the question is like, just to get upright, if something's always pulling you down, can be a task. And I'm like, people live like that. I just wanna get upright across the room. Yes. Some people say levity, not gravity, but levity. Let me just get a little bit of bounce. Let me make you a little joke. And then some people are just seeing if they can fly. It's the deepest challenge to really resist, see how much you can get off the ground and how long you can stay. But I'm like, but that's the whole point. Like, it's really not about the immediate circumstances of the pandemic or a divorce or graduating from high school, I think it's just a question of like contending with gravity. It's everywhere you go on this planet. So let's just try to get upright. 
And then at the end of that, I have to say to him, am I wrong? I don't know. I might be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just dad. I don't know. Yeah. And then he says, yeah, that sounds interesting, dad. Yeah. So, you know, so I think the gravity question, this question of what we're trying to give him, um, the gravity is there just like the earth is. They are, they're together. You know, nothing is so separate that you can't think that the earth is always trying to bury you. It's always trying to pull you, to bring you home, to bring you into it. And you're trying to get maybe somewhere else, you know. So I don't know how to answer the question, but I do think it's a, it's a constant challenge. These questions are everyday questions, you know. And I, I think that, the, like, also that's the reason we go to to poems, right? And yeah. the reason we go to our poetic ancestors and poetic peers, I mean, what the Lord gives me those journals is like this everyday rituals of care in her community. Mm -hmm. This, like, there's this feeling that we already have what we need yeah. um, that I think is steadying in, in that moment of absolute catastrophe, yeah. right? That she's experienced, that her community has experienced. And so, you know, we, we go to poems for that too. Mm. Yeah, and we go to people like, like Octavia Butler. Yeah. You know, we go to Earthseed. And you're making me think too about this, uh, this book my mom used to read me, The People Could Fly. Yeah. Right? Uh, Virginia, Virginia, Virginia Hamilton, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a classic. But that brought me back to the, uh, the Federal Writers Project and these interviews with formerly enslaved people who actually believed in flight, right. which I was unfamiliar with, that archive, right? Some described it as just an eyewitness occurrence. They were in the field one day, they saw our brother run in circles multiple times, and he took off and flew. Solomon. Precisely, yeah. right, right, right. That's, all, that's what Morrison is pulling from, right? Her interviews about that are amazing. And then there are other times where they say, oh, it's a form of magical knowledge we've forgotten, but it can be done still, right? So I'm thinking too just about these practices of, of reading and study and that attempt to just walk up straight. I mean, that's its own ascension, but, but I think about these forms of magical knowledge that are still with us that you're all working with. Um, Please, Leah, you're gonna say something. Well, no, you're making, with flight, you're making me think of um, before the Haitian Revolution sort of officially launched in 1791, there was an earlier attempt with Bukman, um, who was a conjurer, magician, yeah. uh, voodoo practitioner, who got a whole maroon army going, and they they made some amazing headway, you know, against the French colonizers. And he got he got uh, captured several times and escaped, being burned at the flames several times. And the very last time that they caught him, all the eyewitnesses, the enslaved uh, black Haitians, said they saw him turn into a mosquito and fly, uh, fly away from the flames, yeah. and then later credited that mosquito for starting the yellow fever, which was an ally in actually winning the Haitian Revolution yeah. uh, between 1791 and 1804. So that, that power of transmutation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, power of flight is, is old in our, our people's history. Yeah, and you hear, man, those resonances are even in someone like Charles Chestnut, right? Think about the Conjure Woman and other Conjure yeah. Tales and Poe Sandy. I'm teaching that this week. I'm so hyped right now. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm teaching I'm teaching that this week because if you know the story, like Sandy gets turned into a tree and they try to what? Yeah. Cut him down. Talking about the means of production, right? They try to cut this brother down and even as a tree, he's still resistant, right? He's pushing back against the forces that would try to curtail his joy and end his life in that form. And so this commitment to, yeah, transmogrification, transformation, flight. What does Fred say? You know, escape uh, is an activity, not an achievement, right? And if you go all the way back to pre-colonial Yoruba lands, every village had a, a sacred grove whose only, only reason you were allowed to enter the sacred grove was if you needed to turn from human to animal or back. The only reason. Wow. And so, and the Europeans came and they told them to try to get down from the trees and stop turning back and forth into birds and buffaloes mm -hmm. and all that stuff. I mean, it is a fascinating history of, uh, we, uh, the belief is we all, humans, animals, and plants spoke the same language, yeah. we're in the same families, yeah. we're able to easily move between form, mm -hmm. right? Whole different understanding of what it is to be, uh, the kinship, the kinship yeah. that we once inhabited. I'll just say like a total poet making things. I mean, I had already been thinking about trees because the, other line, which came from preparing, preparing the day, was like, you know, the trees is just a telephone pole between the underworld and heaven. That was, you know, just yeah. morning's lines. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I was thinking about it because of like the commonness of trees in the poem, in my own poems, just thinking about coming to y'all and saying to myself, going back to not remembering where those Octavia Butler poems came from, mm -hmm. but the humming sound, her baritone, and just feeling like she's a tree. I mean, she's, yeah. she's like six, she was six foot over six foot tall, the, her complexion, the bark. So all I'm really doing, again, usually in the poems, is trying to make these things 
manifests, which is to say clearly Octavia Butler was a tree, you know, a walking, living tree, probably God too when we get to heaven. We'll be like, oh, Octavia Butler was God the whole time. So I do, <laughs> thinking about these things manifest inside of the poems, it's, uh, yeah, it's very true for us, it's not metaphor. Wow. Bill, I was just thinking about the, the earlier panel and the Aracelis's, uh, uh, suspicion of the cruelty of yeah. killing the insect or killing the animal and the, the frog dissection in your poem and that yeah. sense that maybe maybe it's because there's that recognition that yeah. identification because mm -hmm. we see each other and we know each other in other ways are there any questions from the audience oh please yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. please daniela and then we'll come to the back yeah yeah you sound great Microphone. Thank you. Hi, friends. I'm Daniela. Um, this is so exciting. I cannot, like, between the last panel and this panel, I can't help but to think, as I was saying before, Vivi Francis, particularly thinking about Forest Primeval, her most recent book, particularly thinking about the first poem, Anti Pastoral, where the speaker is transforming. Um, into the different animals that she sees and into the different plants, right? Talking about the, the there's grass in my mouth, my curious tail, right? Um, and I'm thinking about uh, this idea of naming also, because in the poem, you know, there's all this naming happening of plants, right? Um, and in Vivi Francis's uh, um, interview with Nomi Stone, uh, they talk about how naming as a spiritual practice, right? How Vibe Francis says we, you know, first came into this country as a number, but number, and so there's this different relationship to ledger keeping. But now I get to name, and me, for example, writing my poems is me telling you my name, right? And so I'm thinking about. Uh, so I'm trying to find the, the the question in here, but I guess I want to ask what you think about this idea of like uh, naming and this transformation, like. In naming, right, there is this transformational practice um, as you become the thing that you're naming, yeah. right? Um, and that's happening because there's like this taking back of agency. Because if we're thinking about, I promise I'm almost, almost done, but I feel like it's important here because we're thinking about like Vi Vivi's Force Primeval is very much pushing back against the pastoral um, tradition, right? Where it's like white male poets talking about what they want to talk about, right? <laughs> and not getting pushed back, right? But it's like, what does it mean for, you know, the speaker being a black woman to talk about what I want to talk about, which is the land, you know, and and what that, what kind of autonomy it means in reclaiming an I, yeah. you know, in naming a thing and then becoming that thing. What happens when you become, yeah. you know, the, the land that you're taking back? I love that. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that is what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, it all works, <laughs> trust me. No, I'm right there with you. Uh, I mean, it makes me think about my son is named August for two Augusts, Black August, right? Shout out to, to George Jackson, right? May he rest. And also after August Wilson, and my favorite August Wilson character is this brother named Two Kings, right? And I ask him why his name is Two Kings, and it's because after emancipation, every time someone looks at him, he said, oh, no, I'm David and Solomon. You're looking at Two Kings, right? <laughs> And to me, that whole concept is just so raw, right? Yeah, it's, it has to do with autonomy, but it's also about a kind of recovery of value, right? And naming beauty and abundance where once there was ostensibly nothingness, right? And all that is in the name. Morrison in Song of Solomon gives this whole incredible litany of, of names, right? Even just the names of the main characters in that book, Milkman Dead, right? Yeah. First Corinthians, right? And those names are chosen because their father couldn't read and he went through the Bible and it was the, the shape of the name he liked the most, right? So he chose Pilate, right, for example. And the nurse said, you can't name your baby girl Pilate? That's a man's name and that man killed Jesus. He said, you saw the name I picked. Go with the name, right? So there's something too, I think, with black names where you can choose your own system of value even in that moment, right, for her father. He says, I'm, I'm legible in another language, right? Something you can't even see anymore. Right, you call it illiteracy. I'm telling you, there's an art to the shape of this name that I want for my baby girl. So, yeah, names are always on my mind and they're central to our tradition, I think. I was just thinking like the problem with names is how do you engage in a practice of naming that isn't about possession? Oh, right, like going back to Adam, you know? <laughs> but it seems like that's it, it's that creativity or that sense of play 
with, with the language that allows us to escape that. I mean, I'm a, a student of uh, pre-colonial black ecological thought, and so what came to mind when you asked this beautiful question about naming um, is the secret naming traditions of um, the Yoruba, of the Dahomey, of the mm -hmm. Akan. And so uh, it, we have remnants of it still. When you go through initiation and Orisha tradition, you get your names that everyone knows, and you get your secret name that only your intimates know. But every plant has a secret name. Every animal has a secret name. And the, uh, the old, old medicine people are the ones who still remember the names. And that's the only way we recognize each other across species. So if I know the name of that snake and I whisper the name of the snake, it will whisper in my name back and we can talk to each other. And so I think it's not about just naming, it's remembering the name that was given to us by the divine so that we can actually see each other. Yeah. Is that secret life of plants? I mean, yeah, about yeah. About secret like names. Stevie Wonder again here. Oh, secret life of plants. Is that not Stevie Wonder? I mean, we're yeah, still yeah. talking about the the things that are happening in that. Yeah, I mean, you, you guys said it. I think that's all very true <laughs> about the names. Yeah. And I, I mean, I just love that idea too, that that's about relationship too, right? And that name's about intimacy. I have aunts and cousins, I have Aunt Peaches. I don't know what her government name is and who cares, right? It's just, I mean, and it's, you know, speaking of the land, right? Peaches had something to do, I imagine, with sweetness. Maybe she had an affinity for peaches as a little girl, right? But that name is, is carrying memories, is carrying narrative. And there are people I imagine who don't know her as Peaches, right? Maybe people from work. And if I talk to them about my cousin Peaches who works in the, the post office in the city, they don't know who I'm talking about, right? But I know, and it's something that we share and the people who love her share, right? So yeah, there's real bounty too in the intimacy. Nicknames can be cruel too, but sometimes I think they, <laughs> they give over something about a person's history that's wonderful. I think we had another hand in the back. Judy, please. Hi, thanks everybody. Um, I just noticed that um, the idea of composting trauma came off and then the idea of gravity or the earth always wants to bury us. And in that first panel, I was hearing a little bit about recovery and I was thinking, oh, recovering things. Like it sort of had its opposite, like are you finding it or are you covering it again? Anyway, I just, wanted to bring that up and wondered about the composting idea and the burial idea and the recovering idea. I mean, there's that Ellison intro, right, to Invisible Man, where he talks about, he said, I found a home or a hole in the ground, right? It's Imperium and Imperial by Sutton Griggs with this entire city underground. Part of why I wanted to start the program today with the Pitt School um, one, just to bring it back to children's books, we have a book from my son called Light in the Dark that sort of narrates the experience of a little black girl being taught to read in these pit schools, right, which are literally these holes in the ground that black people dug on plantations, would go down there at night and teach one another to read, often the Bible. And I just think about that motif, and it's everywhere, right? Like the underground, we haven't talked about hip hop at all, but the underground is central, right, as a motif and theme in black expressive culture. And some of it to me, always feels like a, a callback to that, like Dunbar's mask, right? The mask that grins and lies. That's about a kind of underground aesthetic, right? Or my friend Jarvis Givens, he's a historian of black education. In his book, Fugitive Pedagogy, he talks about these black teachers unions in the segregated South who would teach Carter G. Woodson's textbooks, right? But what they would have to do, because they were made by the districts to teach these white supremacist textbooks, right? They would put Woodson's textbook in between the pages, right? And so when, uh, let's say the superintendent came by, they would hold up the cover, right, and seem to be teaching from this racist textbook, and actually they're giving them that deep knowledge, right, this knowledge of self from this hidden text, right, this shadow text. And uh, I love the idea that, I don't know, I mean, just thinking about Glissant, again, we have a right to our opacity, right, that there are things we do in the shadows and in darkness, and sometimes recovery is about recovering, right? It's about taking back our slang and our literature and our music and saying that's ours, and you can't decode it because it's a secret name that we share, and that's ours, and that's fine. So I think that's something I've been trying to do again just in my own practice is thinking about what are the ways of knowing that are familiar and dear and precious to me that have nothing to do with a dominant culture's recognition? Right? What are the names um, that I've been called by the people I love and who love me? And what are our practices? And how do we renew those practices uh, as often as possible? So what that made me think about, it's a little slant from that, but is this practice of sacred biomimicry. 
Um, the earth is our primary source. And we've got caught in a dangerous game of telephone where someone interprets the message from the interpretive message from the, so we lost touch with, with what that is. And so when we say we're composting trauma or, or any of these earth metaphors, it's an attempt, I think, to learn how to again read that primary source and to mimic the earth as model. Um, and there's myriad examples of the ways that we're starting to reawaken, recover the ability to do that. Uh, you know, the, the recent research about uh, forest as superorganism, which was laughed at for generations, but trees actually talk to each other. Yeah. There's actually an internet of mycelium, right, that transfer messages and minerals between trees in the forest. They take care of kin and non-kin. Uh, when a mother hub tree is about to die, she dumps all the resources she's gathered in a lifetime into the network to feed the others, right? And so there's this absolutely profound messages about how we are to live, how we are to live in a diverse community, how we are to share. And so um, I think we pull on these poetic metaphors as, as our attempt to, again, learn to read that source and, and to recover the knowledge of how to mimic uh, the wisdom of the earth. I think that's true, too. Um... You know, even the principle, it's one of the peels of existentialism, which is Nietzsche talking about the eternal recurrence. Yep. So it's not fully like reincarnation. It's more like a, a time is like a little telephone coil, if y'all remember telephone coils. So it's going forward, but it's still looping back on itself. And it's so abstract, except when you say, but that's the seasons. That is what every season is doing that. Every season is the same, but coiling back onto the self, bringing us to summer, bringing us to spring, while moving forward. So I think everything is, certainly the earth is the first metaphor. So I have said before, like that's the biggest indication of time travel. The way the seasons move prove that we're always going backwards and going forward at the same time. That it's new, but it's not new at the same time. So yeah, so much philosophy can be rooted in <laughs> the environment. Well, I was just thinking, too, about the, as I was reading about the wetlands, thinking about how sometimes they can be completely submerged or sometimes over. So I was thinking about that sense of recovering and, mm. and that we need, actually need this underwater flooded space in order to recover. Yeah, that's stunning. Any other questions? Right here is our last question. Hi, everyone. My name is Christina. I'm a little scared, but I'm going to try to get this out. Um, everyone so far from the last panel and also this current panel talked a lot about growing up in the rural areas, um, as well as children, right? How do we make sure our children know their roots and are um, in love with those roots? I'm wondering for teachers, I'm an upcoming educator, I'm in school right now. For teachers who are teaching in the city areas, how do we instill that same love of nature and you know, the, the origins of something, right? Where they're coming from, where their cities are coming from, where their stories are coming from, if they're not surrounded by that. They're surrounded by things that are man-made or cultivated by a different hand of some sort. How do we do that? I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. I can start with that one. I was also a public school teacher 17 years, mostly in urban environments. But yeah, I'll tell you this yeah. little story. So when I, we um, were Haitian on my mother's side. So when my sister and I were going to do some work in Haiti uh, back after the earthquake in 2010, the very first thing that she did when we got to the place we were staying is to take out this little glass jar, put some mung bead seeds in it, and start it soaking. I was like, child, what are you doing? <laughs> she said, I have to have my garden everywhere I go. And so she grows mm. sprouts. Whether she's in a hotel room, traveling, she's a traveling poet, right? Yeah. Always has a garden with her at all times. And that was so inspiring to me because I think, and not to be reductionist or cliche, but nurturing life, being able to witness and nurture life is the fundamental common denominator of falling in love with life. And so whether you, you t have the children grow their sprouts or their, their garden on the windowsill or adopt a single tree that they need to hug every day or a single flower in the crack that they diagram and sketch or if they have to watch the moon in its phases night after night for a full cycle and draw a picture and tell you what happened, we can only fall in love with what we know. Yes. And, and knowing is not an abstraction. It's about this intimate and real connection of nurturing and witnessing life. And that can be a very small, single growing organism that lights the fire and, and creates the thirst for more, right? And it grows from there. Yeah. 
And I think it, go, it goes back to what Terrence said about the land is everywhere, yeah. right? We're not actually removed from the world here in New York City. Josh, you and I are both born here in New York yeah. City. You know, and so I think, you know, there's something, it, it's everywhere. And, and, it, and, in, and when I was thinking about Anne Spencer, um, as Amber, you called her a poet of the Harlem Renaissance, but she's from Lynchburg, Virginia, right? So even, Har like, even like the Harlem Renaissance has other parts of the country, other parts of the world in it all the time. And so that's there in the literature too. Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on that idea before my opinion on the question is that, yeah, I mean, it is everywhere. Uh, and the idea, I understand the idea of wanting to colonize it because it's, it wins. It is the earth. So if you come into this place, if you come into a lion's den, you're trying to figure out how to get control of those lions. So I think that people are often continuing with the fact that it is more earth than us, that it, it is number one. We are not number one, that we are at its mercy. It's not at our mercy. So, it, you know, it's somehow we've made it that we're trying to save the world. It's like, uh, the power dynamic is, is wrong there. So that's the first thing. The second thing, though, is like last night I was watching the new season of Atlanta with my 19-year-olds. I time to spend time together. And uh, Paperboy, it just came out, maybe yesterday. He's like on some weird um, scavenger hunt that winds up, he's at the funeral of a dead rapper. And the only person in this space when he comes in is the rapper's widow. And she says, oh, you know, he was crazy. He always had people doing these weird things. And she runs through a few things. And then she points to the corner. And she says, and he wanted everybody that came to have one of those plants. I ain't going to say what kind of plant it was. But Paperboy looks, and it's just all these plants waiting for the people that are coming to the funeral. And he's like, man, that's dope. And I said it to my son, man, that's a fucking great idea. Like, to get people flowers, like, here, take this plant with you, and I will live when you go. And so that idea of, like, the gift of the plant to the kids, uh, this idea that they understand it, it maybe is, you're not getting where it came from, but you're still, the exchange of it, whatever it is that we're doing over the land, it happens everywhere, that's what I'm trying to say. Like the idea that you could find a garden in an urban area is more miraculous than finding a garden in the woods. You know what I mean? Like the idea that that magic can still happen, it takes a little work. So I'm saying that, that just to look in this place of death and see those flowers that are waiting for you says that they are with us everywhere and that they will, they will travel, in fact, that these, these gardens will travel to the kids and to the inner city or wherever else you want them to be. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would add to that, just to reiterate much of what's been said here already, is that the practices travel. So I love the idea of carrying a garden wherever you go with you. I love the idea of bringing in kind of the material practices of ancestors. So the pictures even of Ann Spencer's garden did so much for me. The idea that this was a gathering place for Du Bois and James Walden Johnson and the, you know, the intellectuals of her day and thinking, oh, that's part of what it means to be a black radical thinker too, right? is gardening, is going out into the green and bringing your friends there with you. Um, and the last thing I would say is collaboration, right? With spaces like the New York Botanical Garden, right? Which are part of the city. Like this campus is not separated out from the city. Uh, I would say it belongs to you, it belongs to your students. And I think, you know, the sense of astonishment that I hope you all got to feel that I felt when I got out the car and looked at this place today, I think our young people deserve that. So I'll say as much as is possible as you can collaborate with these kind of institutions and that they can offer the resources to your students, right, who are owed those resources, I think that's a beautiful thing. And so any way we can help, uh, just let me know. I'll be here after. And uh, can we have a round of applause, please, for our panel? Thank you.